Docteur Michael Jones, merci beaucoup d'avoir accepté de donner cette interview vouée à un public francophone qui ne connaît pas forcément votre travail, à moins d'avoir la maîtrise de l'anglais et l'intérêt nécessaire à cela. Vous êtes citoyen des États-Unis d'Amérique où vous menez une carrière d'universitaire fructueuse, écrivant de nombreux livres. Vous êtes l'éditeur de Culture Wars Magazine et fréquemment invité chez Press TV où vous commentez l'actualité, étant allé vous-même en Iran pour une série de conférences aux côtés, me semble-t-il, de Maria Poumier, Jean-Michel Vernochet et Gerold Coleman, entre autres, qui commentent également l'actualité depuis la France. Vous êtes un auteur très prolifique. Votre travail se focalise grandement sur les différents modes de perversion et de soumission de l'esprit qui imprègnent de nombreux aspects de la société moderne, depuis l'industrie cinématographique à l'architecture urbaine, en passant par la musique et la littérature, explorant avec beaucoup de soin les passions coupables cachées derrière le romantisme allemand de Wagner ou de Goethe, par exemple, ou le mouvement Bauhaus en architecture. Fervent catholique, vous avez fait, également voué votre œuvre à promouvoir la défense des valeurs chrétiennes que vous définissez comme une bataille entre le Logos et l'Antilogos, que je résume en la, en la réalisation de la volonté divine incarnée par l'Évangile du Christ, en dépit des réactions impénitentes de, à son universalité. Ceci se reflète dans vos livres alors que vous euh, partez à l'assaut de la dégradation des valeurs morales à l'université de Notre-Dame en Indiana où vous vivez, par exemple, ou encore de ce que vous appelez l'esprit révolutionnaire juif et son impact sur l'histoire du monde, titre de l'un de vos ouvrages. Vos livres sont disponibles en ligne chez culturewars.com et vous diffusez de nombreuses vidéos sur YouTube que je recommande vivement à nos spectateurs afin de lancer notre discussion. Permettez-moi de, de vous renvoyer au courriel où vous avez répondu à ma demande d'interview, euh, où vous exprimez l'idée, je cite, « que les Français furent le vecteur par lequel le Logos arriva dans le Nouveau Monde. Au regard de l'histoire récente et de l'actualité, pouvez-vous, s'il vous plaît, nous en dire davantage ?» Yes, thank you. Uh, I've, all, I've already begun uh, this discussion by talking about the arrival of the the Jesuits, the French Jesuits in North America. Uh, the explorer LaSalle passed by my house in the 17th century. He missed the portage. Uh, say, uh, South Bend, Indiana is significant uh, because there was a portage here. You could take your canoe off the St. Joe River. You could carry it to where the South Bend Airport is now and put it in a little stream and that would take you to the Kankakee and that would take you to the Mississippi. So it was it was one of the links between uh, the Great Lakes or uh, Quebec and the Mississippi. Uh, it, it got replaced by Chicago uh, as the main link because you didn't have to take your canoe out of the water in Chicago. So Chicago became very important in that regard. But this, we're living in New France, and New France was basically created uh, uh, by, obviously, by the French. But uh, the intellectual significance is that it was the French Jesuits who came here and were the cutting edge of Logos in the New World. Not, not just here, uh, the French Jesuits, obviously, in Quebec uh, were very important. This is in the 17th century, right, uh, with uh, Jacques right. Cartier and, uh, and the right. people that followed him. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the middle of the 17th century and the Jesuits coming over here and basically catechizing the Indians as memorialized in the Jesuit relations. The Jesuit relations were a bestseller in France during the, 18th, the 17th and 18th century. Uh, it was basically the French Jesuits who went off on into the woods of Quebec or the Gaspé Peninsula uh, on the moose hunt in order to learn uh, the Indian languages. It was incredibly heroic what they did, uh, writing down the, the, the grammar and the dictionary of these Indian languages Uh, they did the Spanish and Portuguese Jesuits did the same thing in South America in Paraguay. Yes, there's a very and, famous film, obviously, that people um, 
can think of when they think of uh, the Jesuit missionaries. That's the movie The Mission. That's right. That's exactly that's exactly right. And that was about the destruction of the missionaries. And so uh, in in the this is the cutting edge of Logos. This is Logos making an arrival in the new world. The uh, spread of the Christianity Catholic, Catholic. throughout the world. Sorry to, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I, you mean the spread of Christianity throughout the world during the Christian era that followed the colonizers? Yes, the, the Catholic Church, beginning with the Gospel of St. John, the Catholic Church is the vehicle of Logos in human history. And this is just one instance of the spread of Logos throughout the world. Okay. Now, the, the French, <laughs> unfortunately, played a completely negative role in this story as well, because human history is basically the conflict between Logos and anti-Logos. And the vehicle of anti-Logos in, in the 18th century in France was the Masonic Lodge. <laughs> Uh, sent there by England, uh, basically as uh, part of the Whig psychological warfare operation against the House of Bourbon, uh, as of uh, the, gospel, the writing of the Gospel of St. John, the Catholic Church became the vehicle of Logos in human history. And uh, the French, uh, as of the 17th century, were uh, the most powerful country in Europe, and as a result, they became the vector or the vehicle of Logos uh, coming to the New World. The Jesuits, as I, as I mentioned, performed absolutely heroic activity in the forests of uh, Quebec and the Gaspé Peninsula, uh, going, living with the Indians, learning their language, writing their grammars, uh, writing the dictionary of these native languages, and translating the gospel into those languages. Uh, this was, as I said, the vehicle of Logos in human history. Uh, unfortunately, for the progress of Logos, France was also the vehicle of anti-Logos uh, from the 17th into the 18th century, in particular in the 18th century. Uh, the, the vehicle of anti-Logos in France was the Masonic Lodge. The Masonic Lodge, as I point out in the Jewish revolutionary spirit, was a creation of the Whig oligarchs, uh, the people uh, who paid for uh, Isaac Newton, John Locke, uh, these people uh, who had just taken over England as a result of the Glorious Revolution. They had thwarted uh, a Catholic king coming to the throne, and now there was a world war between England and France. And part of their black operation, psychological warfare against the French people, was the creation of Masonic lodges uh, throughout France during the period of the 18th century, the middle of the 18th century. One of the most famous uh, representatives of this anti-Logos was Voltaire. And the most famous book in this regard was his uh, novella Candide. Candide was essentially a calumny against the Jesuits, uh, specifically a calumny against the Jesuits in Paraguay, who had become famous because they had created a, a, first of all, they had done exactly what the Jesuits in North America had done. They had gone into Paraguay, to the jungles of Paraguay. They had taught, uh, they had learned the language, Guarani, uh, which is now uh, one of the official languages of Paraguay because of their efforts. And they had created an economic system unlike anything in the world, an alternative to both capitalism and slavery, which were the two competing institutions in uh, the New World. Voltaire entered into this. Voltaire was an agent of the um, English Freemasons, uh, he met the poet, the great poet Alexander Pope, and Alexander Pope immediately realized that Voltaire was a spy who was spying on him, pumping him for information about uh, English Catholics. He went on to write uh, Candide. Candide uh, stopped the influence of the Jesuits. Uh, their Jesuit relations, particularly the ones about North America, were bestsellers in France during the 18th century. Everybody was reading them. Voltaire knew this, and basically it was a frontal attack on the Jesuits 
that was incredibly successful because he got the Duc de Choiseul to go to Rome and basically get the Jesuits suppressed. The, the Jesuits, this ruined their work in um, South America and Paraguay. And as you mentioned, the movie The Mission is about that. It's exactly about the Masonic destruction of the Jesuit reductions in Paraguay. It also destroyed uh, the um, ability of France to resist Freemasonry. Uh, there is, you could say there's a direct line between the suppression of the Jesuits and the French Revolution. It, the, the Voltaire uh, and the Duc de Choiseul removed the main obstacle to Logos, uh, uh, removed the main obstacle to the Freemasons in suppressing Logos in, in France, and that led to the revolution. And that was a catastrophe for France, and we are still suffering uh, the results of this. So uh, this is just a, a preliminary. I, I, as I mentioned before, I live on Marquette Avenue in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, it was named after Père Marquette, the famous Jesuit who uh, worked uh, uh, among the Indians, uh, was uh, in the, in the, the uh, near Mackinac Island. Uh, ha absolutely heroic figure, one of the many heroic figures of this era. Started out from Quebec in a canoe, uh, paddled all the way across uh, this part of North America, down the Mississippi, almost to the point of New Orleans, and then realized he would fall into the hands of the Spaniards. And so he turned around and paddled back upstream this time, uh, died uh, crossing Lake Michigan, was buried uh, in Ludington on the beach in Ludington. And the Indians uh, from Mackinac Island were so upset that they came down and disinterred his corpse. And he's now buried up, up there now. So this is the, the heroic labor. This was, as I said, destroyed. It was destroyed in South America by the suppression of the Jesuits, and it was destroyed in North America, in Canada, by one single act when Quebec, when Wolfe uh, conquered Quebec. The last day of the year, before the snow set in, uh, Wolfe climbs up the uh, and attacks uh, Quebec from the rear, and suddenly, that's that's the only way into Canada now. You can't get into Canada other than through Quebec, because through the St. Lawrence River. The English now control Canada, and then they engage in their campaign of ethnic cleansing. This is the vehicle of anti-Logos now. Anti-Logos is now in charge of Canada. Let me just give you two instances of what that means. When the English showed up in Nova Scotia, they brought with them Presbyterian missionaries. The Presbyterians refused not only uh, they, they were they announced to the natives that they were going to bring them the gospel. The natives said, uh, basically, you're about 200 years too late. We're already Christians. We're already Catholic. Uh, they were a mixture of French and Mi'kmaq Indians. The English not only refused to speak Mi'kmaq, uh, they had no idea of how to speak Mi'kmaq. They refused to speak French. Uh, everyone had to become an English Presbyterian Catholic in order to call himself a Christian, according to this new regime of anti-Logos. When the, when the English failed to convert these people, they deported them. They engaged in the ethnic cleansing of Nova Scotia, and these French uh, Mi'kmaq Indians uh, people were sent down to Louisiana, where they became Cajuns and where they live to this day. Great poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow called Evangeline talks about this story. It's part of America, America's history. The another another, mm. another instance, just to give you one more instance, uh, the French, the English took over the Fort, Fort Michi Milli Mackinac on the Straits of uh, Mackinac, right where Father Marquette is buried. And they introduced the new regime at the trading post, which meant bringing Jews in to trade with the Indians. The Jews immediately started cheating the Indians. The Indians are furious. They're playing ball at one point outside the fort. They kick the ball over the fence. Uh, they ask to let in to get the ball back. They go in and they slaughter everyone. And then they declare their allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church and the King of France. This is the situation of Logos in North America at that point. Mm. With the... Inter the guilty intervention of it seems the usual culprits or 
interest of people who profit from a situation to cheat on the on the on the people. It's quite amazing um, the the extent of um, cognitive bias that has uh, permeated the minds of uh, of uh, Western Europe today because. Um, um, the United States or America, modern, Mar modern America appears to be essentially um, the heritage of the British and uh, of uh, the, the fabled <laughs> conquest of the West, where um, the ethnic cleansing is uh, hidden behind uh, this, uh, uh, this pioneering adventure uh, of uh, these uh, hapless uh, pilgrims. Uh, moving across uh, the vast expanse of uh, of the continent. Um, yes. Yes. After, after so, the uh, revolution, so after the revolution, yeah. Napoleon went on to sell New France, Nouvelle France, right. to 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 um, to right. the, the United States, which had That's been right. founded with uh, a constitution which uh, seg segregates people and um, was uh, itself uh, quite uh, quite a Quite something. What's your? Do you have an opinion on the American Constitution? Um, if uh, if I may um, move the conversation in that in that direction. Yes, yes. But be, be, before before I mention, that, I want to mention one other movie. Uh, the movie is called Black Robe. I don't know whether you've seen it. It's worth watching because it's the story of the Jesuits in North America, and basically the defeat of the Jesuits in North America, the defeat of the, uh, the French, uh, Canadian Indians at the hands of the British. The British, as I said, brought in uh, uh, Jewish traders. They were the people that ran Fort Orange, which is now Albany in New York. And uh, it was a completely different strategy. The French wanted the best people over here. The English brought their criminals and, uh, and, the, and the Jews. And the Jews at this point uh, began selling both whiskey and guns to the Iroquois. The Mohawks were on the French side. The Mohawks were Catholic. The English made no attempt whatsoever to convert these people to Christianity because they were using them as their proxy warriors. And that's, in effect, what happened. The Iroquois, the French built a, a, um, a fort state-of-the-art fort for the Indians, the Catholic Indians, at Pentaguashene in, now in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Ontario. It's on the, on the banks of the lakes, uh, the Georgian Bay. And uh, the Indians uh, tried to teach them how to stand their ground, how to fight inside of a fort using modern military technology. The Iroquois showed up, the Mohawks panicked, they weren't familiar with the fort. They all ran off into the woods and they were all slaughtered. Now, this is sort of the background to the movie Black Robe. And the question is, the question in history, which is the, what I'm talking about, the, the movement of Logos in history, is did the English thwart the movement of Logos in history? And I think if we look at uh, a movie like Black Robe, you have to say yes. And so the movie ends with this Jesuit off in the middle of nowhere in his cabin. I don't know where he is, Lake Superior or someplace like that in the middle of nowhere. And he's just full of despair because he watched that whole noble enterprise gets destroyed by the British, the Jews, and uh, their proxy warriors, the Iroquois. So the question is, can you, can man, can evil, man doing evil, which is what the Freemasons did in France, can that thwart the course of Logos in human history? Yes or no? That's the big question. Okay? You don't have to answer that question. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm writing the book about, to answer that question. But what I'm saying is that it did not. That there's some uncanny way in which the French spirit, the French Catholic spirit, kept returning to North America. There was, of course, you mentioned the the revolution. You mentioned the uh, the Constitution, which was written under the influence of Whig ideology in the United States. It was, in many ways, the cutting edge of is it logos or is it anti logos? It wasn't hard, it wasn't easy to tell back in 1776. Now we know we know the answer. 
America is the evil empire. America is the great Satan. Uh, we're, we're all praying for the end of the American empire. I think Donald Trump is going to bring about the American empire after completely antagonizing all of his allies in Europe, which is what he's doing right now. The state of the art right now is that the secretary of the treasury, one of these people there, has given Europe an ultimatum. Either you buy from us or you buy from Iran. You're not allowed to buy from Iran after Trump unilaterally re, re, uh, revoked the, the uh, Iran nuclear agreement. This is the state of affairs right now. And I personally think that uh, the United States, Donald Trump, has been appointed by God to bring about the end of the American empire in a way that Hegel would understand uh, and what he would call the, uh, the cunning of reason, the list of vernunft. OK, but. To get back to our story, uh, it, tur it turns out that Logos returned again to the United States, and it was Frenchmen who brought it here again. And I'm talking about the 20th century now, and I'm talking about people like Jacques Maritain and Etienne Gilson and the Thomas Revival. Who were these people, Dr. Jones? Please tell, tell me about them, because I... We, you, you wrote to me about them, and I replied that I had not heard of them. I wasn't taught about them at, in school, and uh, I've not come across them since. Yes, that's right. They are Jacques Maritain was probably the most famous Frenchman in the world. Uh, certainly, he was the most famous Frenchman in the United States uh, during the period from about 1930 until 1960. He was in. He he went first to the University of Chicago, uh, which was a university founded by the Rockefellers, and there is huge uh, tur turmoil because the American philosophy had basically run out of gas, as we would say here. We're talking about pragmatism, John Dewey. Uh, this was the official behaviorism, which was the uh, basically the official sociological ideology of the University of Chicago, the Rockefeller University. And Maritain shows up there largely because of two men, Robert Hutchins and Mortimer Adler. Adler's a Jew who was a Thomist, a Jew and a Thomist, uh, an unusual combination absolutely convinced of the that uh, Thomism was the vehicle, Thomism me, being the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a professor in Paris during one of the crucial uh, his, moments in the history of Logos, uh, the middle of the 13th century, toward the end of the 13th century. Pierre Duhem, the famous French physicist, said that science, modern science was born in Paris in 1277, when Bishop Etienne Tampier condemned of heroism. This is the, the Thomism. It was because of that that science developed there, and Thomism was the vehicle that allowed it to develop, the philosophical vehicle that allowed it to, de to develop. And now the representative of Paris, of France, of Thomism, of the entire tradition of Logos, uh, of Christianity as focused in the Middle Ages in Paris is now in America. So we have the same thing again. It's like the 17th century all over again, except it's not Jesuit missionaries. It's Thomas, like Maritain and Etienne Gilson. Mm -hmm. It's the resurgence of spirit, as you might say. I think that's exactly what we're talking about here. And so America, as I said, is just America. Uh, who, who said this? It's a, it's a country that went from barbarism to decadence without finding civilization along the way. That, that seems very true today, uh, where we have uh, uh, drag queens reading library books to uh, children. Uh, with official patronage of uh, the mayor, the gay mayor of South Bend. That's the way it feels today, but it did not feel that way in the 1930s, I guarantee you. And the 1930s was one of those crucial moments in history where, again, we're faced with a choice. And the choice is, once again, it's always the same choice. It's Logos or anti-Logos. And anti-Logos is this American Protestant spirit. 
Okay, the culmination of that, it's been refined. The, the, the religious element has pretty much disappeared. We have American pragmatism, a kind of crude uh, philosophical instrument that uh, basically panders to American interests. And now there's a debate in Chicago between the pragmatists and the Thomists. And it's Maritain and Gilson on one side and John Dewey and a whole bunch of other people on the other side. And the pragmatist lost the argument. Okay? They lost because it's a weak, it, there would be no challenge. Okay? The French just cleaned up. They defeated them. But the other people in this Chicago <laughs> were the ones that they should have been thinking about. So in, in, in Florian Michel's book, which uh, is a great book on this, La Pensée Catholique dans Nord Amérique, it uh, hasn't been translated into English, but it's a great book uh, because it talks about all of the characters that were there. And one of the characters he mentions at the University of Chicago is Louis Wirth, a Jew from uh, Germany. Family came from Trier. And Louis Wirth was not a philosopher. He was a sociologist. And what he was involved in was psychological warfare, literally. No doubt about it. He was part of the psychological warfare establishment uh, for the United States during World War II. Uh, the Office of uh, OWI, Office of War Information, was that the propaganda ministry. It was related to the OSS, and all of these things got subsumed into the CIA after the war. So he's the psychological warfare expert, and he, at the time, the same time that Maritain defeats Dewey and those people in cycle in, in a philosophical battle at Chicago. He's working on the ethnic cleansing of Chicago. He's from Chicago, and after World War II, there is a civil war in Chicago. It's called social engineering. The basis of it is social engineering. Social engineering was created at the University of Chicago as part of the psychological warfare effort there. And it begins with the movement of black Americans from the South, into Chicago, flooding them into Catholic neighborhoods and destroying their neighborhoods. Louis Worth was intimately involved in that. And so as a result, the real battle shifted. The battle between Logos and anti-Logos was not a philosophical battle. It was a psychological warfare battle. And unfortunately, Jacques Maritain, brilliant as he was, didn't have a clue, didn't understand at all because no Catholic understood what was going on at the time. Obviously, because it's underhand uh, dealing, in, in a sense. It's behind your back uh, maneuvering. That's right. That's right. If you knew, social engineering only works if you don't know that it's wor working on you. That reminds me of uh, the motto of the beta, I believe, that says, uh, through deception, we wedge war. You know, it's, uh, was it the beta or, or it's the Dagana, some, uh, some Israeli um, military outfit? The Mossad. That's the, that's the Mossad, the motto of the Mossad. Oh, right. Okay, it's the Mossad then. Three deceptions, so, they wage war. There you go. So, so uh, in, the, in the 18th century, it was the Freemasons versus the Catholics. Now it's a coalition of the Protestants and the Jews. The Protestants are known as WASP, White Anglo-Saxon Protestants at this time. They're not really, they're Protestant by, by sociological category, not by religious belief for the most part. And the liberal Jews like Louis Wirth, and they combine in a war against the Catholics. All of, all of American history is a function of the triple melting pot, which means there are three ethnic groups in the United States based on three religions, uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jew. This is a crucial, if you don't understand this, you can't understand American history at this period of time. Maritain mentioned it. Uh, he wrote a book about America, Reflections on America, completely naive. He, it was like the classic European. Have you, are you familiar with Babar? Babar, the elephant, of course I am. It was one of my childhood uh, favorites. Uh. Yeah, well, there's a there's a book we had. I used to read it to my son. It's called Babar Comes to America. Okay, uh, I don't and, remember it. <laughs> and and this is this is exactly it's like Maritan. Maritan was Babar. Mm. He came to America and he had this kind of. Uh, he's looking at America from the point of view of a Thomas philosopher who's about 
50,000 feet up in the air and everybody loves him. He's been giving awards. He's got he's got access to all of the elites. The elites are sincere uh, to a large extent. I'm talking about the philosophy departments at Harvard, uh, University of Chicago, places like that. They are sincere. There are sincere people there. Uh, and he is their champion and he loves it. And as a result, he completely misses the reality of what is going on in the United States of America, which is psychological warfare and social engineering. He mentions all of the players. He mentions Gunnar Myrdal, uh, the book, The American Dilemma. He gives you the standard uh, liberal take on the race situation in America. Uh, he mentions Louis Worth. He mentions all of these people, but he can't put two and two together. He can't connect the dots. It's one of the tragedies of, of, once again, tragedy of Logos, the progress of Logos in human history. So America has the chance, and it gets destroyed once again. It's like a replay of Voltaire, Candide, the suppression of the Jesuits, but in a completely different uh, key than it was back then. And... Um... Well, we're living very troubled, even if they're interesting times, as the Chinese uh, would say. Um, well, we're living in the aftermath of the defeat of Logos in our, our age. This is what happens. Okay, you def the Catholic Church, as I said, is the vehicle of Logos. They had an incredible power, incredibly strong presence in the United States at that time. And that's why Maritam was received so avidly because the church was strong. In the 1930s, the church could uh, threaten the Jews who ran Hollywood with a boycott, and the Jews capitulated, and the, the Catholics kept the Jews under control in Hollywood for 30 years. And then after this, the end of the Second Vatican Council, the church uh, basically collapsed as a, an institution that held the civil power in line, held them uh, accountable to the moral law. I believe you've worked a lot on uh, the Second Vatican Council and uh, the origins of uh, this uh, this perversion of uh, Catholic dogma. Uh, you've related it back to Cardinal Rampolo, I believe, at the beginning of the 20th century. It's a, it's a very interesting subject, uh, which the French audience is not necessarily familiar with. Um, and, uh, yeah, so so Mar Maritain had a huge influence on the thinkers in the Catholic Church. He had a huge influence on Pope Paul VI. And the huge influence, he had a huge influence on, on uh, uh, Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. Ratzinger gave a speech in 2005 when it was, what was it like to be at the Second Vatican Council? And he said, uh, during this time, we realized that the American Revolution was different than the French Revolution. The French Revolution was anti-clerical, but the American Revolution was not. It was something else. Well, okay, I can understand that, but it had a devastating effect on the council and on the understanding of America. And this was all traceable to Jacques Maritain. You can read his book, Reflections on America, and you can realize he wrote this in 1956, I believe. It had a, this is this is two years before the death of Pius XII, and at this point the Church realizes it's in a state of crisis, and Cardinal Ottaviani then goes to Pope John the Twenty Third and says, "We have to hold a council." If you read if you read Cardinal Ottaviani's preliminary documents. There are two threats to the Catholic Church. One is the Soviet Union. Everybody knew that. The other threat is America. Well, wait a minute. I thought America was opposing the Soviet Union. Well, yeah, they were. But Italy and the Catholic Church, by extension, was caught up in the Cold War and was choosing the wrong, not to say the wrong side, was choosing sides when it shouldn't have chosen sides. It should have remained neutral, and that's what Ottaviani was trying to do. And uh, his all of his preliminary documents were swept away. And I'm saying the main, the main influence that allowed the church to sweep these documents away was Jacques Maritain, and it was in particular Jacques Maritain's understanding of America. 
which was completely distorted by his position as this by his naivety in the United States during the period we're talking about. During the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, there was no more famous Frenchman in America than Jacques Maritain. Nobody knows this, but it was absolutely the case, and it had a devastating effect on the church through the council because people began to just idolize America. And they, they forgot, they, they didn't realize there was an American empire at this time, and that the American empire would become more and more tyrannical as time went on, to the point where we are today, where it is a completely tyrannical presence in the world. Okay. Um, these, are, these are things that you're going to um, include in your book, your writing at the That's moment. That's right. Which... Um, um, from watching other videos, it's going to be a very interesting book and very um, quite definitive book on 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 Logos and the Battle of Logos and Anti Logos. Um, do you want to um, tell our listeners more about it that they can find out more at CultureWars.com? Uh, yeah, I yeah go to CultureWars.com. Actually, you can read uh, chapters in the book if you want. They're uh, they've been published as articles in. Uh, Culture Wars magazine. We have a brand new website. It's much easier to access now. Uh, you can get either you can get the books I've written already, like the story of the Jesuits in North America is in my book Barren Metal, which is a history of capitalism as the conflict between labor and usury. The whole concept of historical concept of logos versus, versus anti logos became part of human history when the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, who was the Logos incarnate. And you can read that story in the Jewish revolutionary spirit. You can read the story of, of the social engineering and the ethnic cleansing of the Catholics in the big cities of uh, the United States of America in my book, The Slaughter of Cities, Urban Renewal as Ethnic Cleansing. And also you can read, uh, again, uh, the other uh, side of uh, social engineering, the sexual part of social engineering, my book, Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation and Political Control. And once again, uh, that began in, in, in France. One of the main architects of how to use sexual passion as a form of control was the Marquis de Sade. And he, he uh, created this, in the Bastille, he wrote the book while he was imprisoned in the Bastille and was the man who, in effect, set off the French Revolution. And the French Revolution then became, through Napoleon and so on and so forth, big story, but uh, the, the vehicle of anti-Logos uh, in history at that time. I just finished the chapter on Hegel. Hegel uh, was uh, in Jena when Napoleon wrote in after conquering Prussia. And he calls him the Weltgeist zu Pferd, zum Pferd, uh, basically the world spirit on horseback. So all of that is in, is in the Logos book, and you can get all the backgrounds of the Logos book by going to culturewars.com. Indeed. Um, is any of uh, your work available in French, um, by any chance? For me, live? No. Not yet? No. Uh Perhaps someday you'll 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 have some of uh, your work translated. It will be um, in, inshallah, <laughs> as we say. Si Dieu le veut. Uh, in, te in in Tehran, where I met Ger Gerard Colmain or Colmain. Could um, could you spare a few minutes to to comment um, the news in France uh, that you see from afar across uh, the Great Divide of the the Atlantic? Um, for instance, what's your take on the fire at Notre Dame Cathedral and uh, the reconstruction projects that have been presented to rebuild it? Well, uh, it seems to me that it had to have been started. It had to be a case of arson. Definitely. Uh, after reading the reports about the, the workmen closing the place down, there was no possibility that this could have started by accident. It fits in with the pattern of uh, churches being burnt to the ground uh, in other parts of France. Um, it was it was one of those incidents where uh, 
I think the the oligarchs who control France now are desperate for a way to escape from the the uh, gilets jaunes uh, protest. This is what you're seeing across the world. That the election of Donald Trump, Brexit, and the yellow vests in France are all manifestations of a world spirit awakening now to the fact that they everything that the oligarchs have called freedom is really a form of control and that we are now enslaved to a very small group of people who are completely uh, contemptuous of the majority and will do everything within their power to keep them enslaved with all of the uh, means of social engineering and psychotechnology that I've also already described. So how do you stop that? Well, they don't know. They don't know. In the United States, what we're seeing now is uh, basically Jewish control of the Internet being imposed. Uh, the name of this control, the vehicle of control, is called hate speech. Hate speech is a creation of the Anti-Defamation League, which is the main Jewish uh, thought police organization in the United States. The Jews are a crucial part of the oligarchy, uh, and they uh, evidently have a role to play in France as well. Uh, if you didn't know this, there was a BBC reporter uh, who's there in, in Paris. Uh, the tear gas is flying, you know, the protest is reaching its height. And suddenly some man with a yellow vest comes in front of the camera and says, Macron, put juive, Macron, the whore of the Jews. <clears throat> so this is the, 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 the popular, the vox populi jumping in front of the BBC camera and saying something that uh, you're not allowed to say. But that's precisely what, uh, what the issue is here. The issue is in the United States, in Europe, it's even worse. England, it's worse. Uh, we have reached a point now where if you criticize a Jew... For your you information, for your information, Dr. Jones, the situation is really very serious here in France, where we have uh, a law, the Loi Gesso, uh, the guy who presented it was named Gesso, uh, which forbids us to uh, contest the results of the Nuremberg trials. So you're not allowed to uh, doubt pretty much. And you're not able to doubt in public that there were six million dead, uh, that the gas chambers, etc., etc. And uh, I'm going to have to be careful in my translation and on posting this video. Uh, in yeah, case I don't, I get I don't it want to break off. the law, okay? But I do want to talk about the situation. So do and I. I, will, so tell do you, I will tell you right now exactly what the situation is in the United States of America, okay? I, uh, I've, I've been on many YouTube videos. I get requests every day to do a, an interview. So one of them turns out to be a man by the name of Michael Brown. He, he calls himself a Christian, but he's a Jew. And he starts talking to me about anti-Semitism. <clears throat> okay, I'm trying to explain to him. Anti-Semitism is a racial concept. It was created by Wilhelm Marr in Germany in 1871 because he didn't want to use the traditional religious categories to talk about Jews. So I said, I don't believe, I don't subscribe to uh, anti-Semitism. I don't believe that Jews are determined by their DNA. Their behavior is not determined by their biological makeup. Well, this isn't good enough for Dr. Brown because he says, uh, we get into a discussion of scripture in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, in particular, where St. Paul says the Jews are the people that killed Christ and they are enemies of the entire human race. And I said, well, as a Christian, I have to follow that. And he says, well, you've got the wrong interpretation. I said, well, what's your interpretation? He said, well, it's, uh, he's not talking about Jews. He's talking about Judeans. I said, this is crazy. I know what the Greek is. It's hoi judeoi. It's the Jews. Well, OK. He then calls me a Christian anti-Semite which is a contradiction in terms, but that's what he does. Well, okay? it's a Kabbalistic play on words, so to speak, isn't right. it? So, so two days later, a man walks into a synagogue in Poway, California, and starts shooting people and kills one person. Then Dr. Brown announces that I am responsible, that my rhetoric has caused this. I said, no, wait a minute. I'm not responsible. I've been saying no one has the right to harm the Jew I've been uh, uh, representing the Catholic position. I've been saying, don't harm the Jew. OK, two days later, the ambassador from 
Israel shows up in the United States. He goes before the United Nations and he says, the time for discussion is over. We now have to make anti-Semitism a criminal act. It's, it's going to be against the law now. So you see what happens here. Now, if, if you disagree with a Jew over something like, say, the interpretation of 1 Thessalonians 2, you can now go to jail if these people have their way. This is already the situation in England. Jez Turner is in, went to jail because he did a video on the, um, the Jewish police force in London. No one contested the truth of what he said. But if some Jew is upset by what you say, you go to jail. And this is the United States has been the exception. And now the Jews are pressing for these hate crime legislations all across the United States right now. It's a crucial, critical situation. And we as Americans have to stand up and say this is completely antithetical to everything that America stands for. Yes, um, you know, um, I've, I was brought up um, a Catholic uh, with Catholic upbringing. I was lucky enough to even go to a Benedictine school uh, for, for eight years. Um, and um, I was brought up with great admiration for, uh, for America, for, for the United States and uh, um, milked by Hollywood films, etc. And it took me to... It, that took me into adulthood um, until I realized and woke up at my awakening moment, like uh, many people have done, and uh, more and more do so in, uh, in, in recent times. Um, and indeed, uh, America did seem like, uh, like uh, a paragon of, uh, of, of many virtues of uh, self-determination uh, within uh, the... the within a, a very uh, free and open society, and I don't mean open society in a Soros, <laughs> in a Soros style, but uh, in, a, in a free and um, mature adult society, intellectually mature society. And um, it seems to me that um, on 9-11, on um, a certain version of... Uh, version of that um of that virtue was uh, was brought down by um by um some culprits okay um because um at the top of the world trade center was uh, the commodities market which um which was not in wall street which dealt with the derivatives and all the options and all the uh the speculation and the usury um, at the top of the World Trade Center was uh, the, the place where you traded orange juice and wheat and, and things like that. And um, when it got taken down, um, the commodities market got more and more volatile because it got transferred to, to Wall Street, I believe. And this eventually led to the Arab Spring because of the uh, food riots in Tunisia, etc., etc. And um, that was like um, a version of... Um, to me, at least, it's 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 a very personal in, in personal interpretation. Um, um, an attack at the, um, the 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 good virile vir virtues of uh, of man in in Western civilization, and it seems to me that um, with the fire at Notre Dame, it's uh, the um, maternal side of, of uh, Western civilization, which is coming under attack. Uh yes. I'm, I'm saying that that debate took place in America during the 1930s. It was America first who wanted to keep the United States out of the war. I'm saying that the Frenchmen, uh, Maritain and Gilson, Yves Simon, others, played a crucial role in that debate because they represented Thomism, which was the cutting edge of Logos at that time, still is in, some, in many respects. And I'm saying that that debate ended by, as the French say, force majeure, okay? Uh, with Pearl Harbor, the, uh, the, the debate was over. Uh, my, 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 friend, my, my friend, my late friend Henry Regnery's father was the treasurer for America First, Henry Regnery told me that the FBI showed up one day after Pearl Harbor and demanded the mailing list of America First and killed that organization. That was the end of that debate. 
And after that, it was the American empire in control. The American Republic perished at that point, and the American empire took over. Okay. Thank you very much for that insight, Dr. Jones. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, considering how visibly corrupt the political class has become in France and elsewhere, um, do you have um, what kind of advice would you like to give to people with good faith um, in order to face the upcoming times? The, the advice here is that you you are not alone here. That there is a force behind human history called divine providence, and it will not be repressed. So, how many times has this failed? Just uh, what I've spent my time talking about today is France as the vehicle of Logos in human history in the New World. How many times has that failed? And yet, how many times has it come back? It will always come back because Logos is the force of human history. It is the force behind human history. Logos, as St. John said, is God. You cannot suppress Logos. You may think you can. You may succeed for a moment or two. But over the long haul, you cannot suppress it because it is the power of God. And we have to be aware of that, first of all, to keep us from getting discouraged, okay, when it seems that there's some type of defeat, uh, but aware that our actions are part of the force of human history. There's only one choice you have when it comes to human history. You can be on the side of Logos or you can be on the side of anti-Logos. There's no other choice, ultimately. And uh, the, the forces of anti-Logos may seem to have the upper hand, but they always lose because God is on the other side. So that's the message I would say to, to everyone, but especially people in France. Mm. Right. Thanks very much, Dr. Jones, for, for this kind advice. Um, I'm going to look into Jacques Maritain and um, possibly um, listeners will want to do so as well and uh, try and renew uh, the, the links, the ties that there, there have been uh, through all times between the French people of goodwill and other people all around the world. Um, I'm going to leave the, um, the links to Culture Wars magazine and to your YouTube channel in the description uh, for the people who are curious to, uh, to explore it. And um, I'd like to thank you very much again for this interview, and uh, I hope to speak to you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Send me the link. I will do. I will do. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Dr. Good John. talking to you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.